Welcome to the Business Trendsetter Podcast, where we talk about trends and how to use them to grow your business. My name is Manny Turan. And I'm Adam Hartung. We are Spark Partners. We help companies grow by understanding, following trends, and we offer lots of insights on lots of things on this podcast. And uh, today, oh, hold on. A little birdie's telling me something, Adam. <laughs> A little birdie's telling me that uh, we should talk about Twitter today. And before I dive into that, I want to talk a little bit about my background. So communication is a pretty massive thing. We think about it. You know, a lot of the uh, things that happen in this world are because of the transference of information. Uh, I tell my two boys all the time that the most powerful thing on this planet is the an idea, the power of an idea. And an idea is only as good as who actually uh, hears it, understands it, and actually goes out and implements it. So ideas and communication have always been uh, a big pet project of mine. When I was a kid, I was a ham radio operator and I was building little shortwave uh, uh, radios. And so for me, the ability to, to have this uh, framework that we have here in this podcast is, is a dream come true. Uh, and of course, we've got other platforms like Instagram and TikTok and all these other ones. But one of the grandfathers, if you will, of the social media platforms is of course the venerable Twitter. And I know that you got a lot of, uh, of growth in your early career, um, well, early social media career, we'll say, with Twitter. So I wanted to get your thoughts on what's happening with Elon, why he's doing what he's doing, what's, you know, what's wrong with Twitter, is it fine, is it bad, what's going on, Adam? Well, let me start off by asking you a question, Manny. And uh, as somebody who doesn't spend your whole life in social media, you're a user, you're an advertiser. Um, what what do you think? Uh, what, what were your thoughts? What went through your mind when you heard that uh, he was going to spend about $54 a share and it was $40 billion to buy the whole of Twitter? What was your thought thinking on that? How did you react to it? So there's the sort of that face value part of it, you know, wanting to unbuckle and, you know, open up the, the, the reins, so to speak. Uh, and I saw that initially as like, okay, he's trying to do something with that. But knowing Elon, he's got a, a, a different idea of what he wants to do with this. He's got something further down the, the way. He's not a uh, one-year kind of thinker guy. You know, this is a guy who's thinking a thousand years in the future. And so having this, this pulpit, essentially, is uh, giving him something that he needs down the road, whether it's a way to get his, his message out quicker, I, I don't know. So I was a little bit sort of skeptical, but I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. Well, let me ask you the next question, which is how much do you use Twitter? How, many, how often do you read tweets and how often do you post tweets? Um, I think in my entire life, I've probably uh, tweeted twice. <laughs> Okay. And, and it goes the same. I, I have it on my phone. I don't listen to it very, uh, or you know, look at it very often. I'm I'm constantly on on uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and recently TikTok. Uh, but Twitter is is has not been my bailiwick. Okay, and a lot of people would say they don't, don't get it. But that gets me to the next question, which is, what do you think is Twitter's value proposition? Well, you've got to start with the, the fact that you're able only to tweet a certain amount of information in one shot. So there's a certain conciseness of the message. I would say that it'd be uh, the dissemination of, of uh, information very quickly. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm going to congratulate you because that's better than anything I could come up with. <laughs> I think the, the fact that you only posted a couple of tweets in your life and you rarely look at it indicates that that value proposition is not clear. Whatever the value proposition is, is not clear. And it's in a very real way, isn't all that compelling. Um, I think if, to, to be very honest with you, had it not become a platform for politicians, and in one politician in particular used it pretty extensively, I, I don't know that the platform itself would really be out there. I, I'm not sure how much it would be used. And so that's what I want to take a 
little time now and, and bring home for our listeners, which is that you really have to know your value proposition and you really have to build on your value proposition. And I have, in all of the discussion that's going on with Elon Musk and all the stuff I hear on MSNBC or CNN, nobody's saying what the value proposition of Twitter is. They're talking about whether or not Elon Musk is going to turn it into a political platform. If then, you know, what does he mean when he says that he wants First Amendment rights and to, and to cause greater transparency? And they throw all these words around. And there's a lot of people been talking about it ever since he, he made this, this offer, started down this road. And I, I hear the people, the journalists, I, I, there's this guy named Brian Stelter who has a one-hour program on, uh, on Sunday mornings on CNN, and he talks about it. But none of them say what the value proposition is of, of, uh, of Twitter. And so I want to go back and, and, and take a look at the, this and, and let you know that, in my opinion, Musk is buying um, an empty vessel. He's paying way too much for it, and it's, uh, he'll never get his money back. I think the fact that he's using a lot of debt to buy this is a bad sign. Uh, companies that get highly leveraged in a, in a leveraged buyout like this typically uh, struggle. Uh, very few of them ever pay the debt off, and, and the vast majority of them end up in bankruptcy. And uh, this is a case in point in that I think whereas uh, some other LBOs, you might have had a clear value proposition, here there is none, and I don't hear Musk talking about one, and I don't hear anybody talking about one. I recall very vividly on October the 10th, 2010, I got my 10,000th follower on Twitter. Wow, that's a milestone there. <laughs> It, it was 10, 10, very 10. accidental. <laughs> it's very accidental that it happened on that date. Uh, but I had joined up on Twitter in 2009. I think it was. It might have been 08, but around 08, 09. And I was uh, using the platform. And in those days, um, there weren't bots out there. There weren't a lot of fake accounts. And what we did was we would go on to Twitter and you would say, this is what I'm interested in. And I was talking about innovation. That was my number one topic. Innovation and how people could use innovation and, and, uh, and a few derivative topics around that, like social media. And so what happened was those of us that would go on Twitter would say what our interests were. And the idea of Twitter, the reason of the bird, was the idea that you would uh, that we would find each other, that other people that are interested in innovation would find me, I would find other people interested in innovation, and we would create, it would be these self-forming little networks inside the platform. And it actually worked pretty well. Um, and I wrote a, uh, I'm going to have to read some of this stuff because I had to go back and remind myself, but back in, uh, in February of 2012, I wrote a blog. Uh, again, in those days I was writing for myself and it needs to be found on adamhartung.com, but I was also writing for Forbes. And I wrote a f blog about how a company named Jefferson Financial had used Twitter as its primary marketing tool. And it went out looking for people interested in financial advice and it really targeted uh, uh, financial planners and they started talking about different kinds of investment tools people could use. Now this is important because you might remember this is the Great Recession. Okay, so we're coming out of the Great Recession and, and they had done something pretty magical. Between 2010 and 2011, right in the middle of the Great Recession, everybody hates financial investments. They grew their company from 180 million to 280 million. And they did it almost all on Twitter. Wow. by going out and finding other people interested in financial services and financial products. And they abandoned traditional advertising. They did some on Facebook and they did a little bit, but most of it was focused on Twitter. And it was finding these financial analysts and telling them, look, we have products that we offer for people who want high growth. We have people who want high dividends. We have well, you know, different sort of niches of, of consumers. And they used that to build a community of, of people interested in financial services. And I highlighted how with very, very little spending, they almost doubled the size of their company in one year in the middle of the Great Recession. It's called Jefferson Financial. Then in 2000, February 2013, there was an event that I thought really sparked the value of, of Twitter and, as you said, immediacy and touching customers. Again, at that point in 2013, we would sit around and have Twitter on, like, watching the football game. And you would communicate. And so one of the biggest football games of all is always the Super Bowl, right? And so yeah. the Super Bowl of 2013 was going along. Now, the number one ad in that year for the Super Bowl cost over $2 million to run that one ad. And the name of it was by Chrysler. And the name of the ad was God Made a Farmer. Do you remember that at all? No. Right. <laughs> I, I Maybe a pickup truck. I don't know. Maybe a Dodge Ram 
commercial? I don't know. I wrote a blog about it, and I don't remember it at all. And I moved in the blog. I said, we'll all forget it. The, the, point, the point was is that people spent a lot of money to run an ad on the Super Bowl, and how long do you remember it? It was two million bucks. But the thing I bet you do remember about that game is that was when the lights went out. Do you remember that? When the lights went out in the arena and we were down for like 10 or 12 minutes, something like that, trying to get the lights back on? Yeah. Okay. So at that time, so you have all these ads on the Super Bowl, they're all costing millions of dollars and you know, plenty of money is being spent. But at that time, there was a company called 360i, which was a social media advertising company, and they had picked up an account called Oreos. And they picked it up uh, from Mondelez, which owned Oreos, owned, owned the brand. And when the lights went out, they tweeted nine words to the, all of us that were there watching the Super Bowl. People were twittering, or what's going on there, and when lights go out, what do I have lights go out? Is that planned? Is it an accident? Is it dangerous? Are they going to get everybody a blah, blah, blah? In the middle of that, the, the 360i tweeted, no problem, you can still dunk in the dark. It was retweeted over 10,000 times almost immediately. And on Monday, it caught the cycle of the news cycle where people said, you know, they were so it was so clever for them to do that. That Twitter tweet cost nothing. It was absolutely free, and it got the most memorable ad of the entire Super Bowl, right? And what they did was they reached people that were interested in the game, and they caught us all at the same time, and they got us with a quick message. And, and so what I'm trying to say is there was a value proposition then. I was online with Twitter, other people online. We were interested in people that were like us. We were watching an event, or in my case, I would catch on with people interested in innovation. And we were communicating and steering each other to websites and steering each other to articles. And, and it really was a community of people that interacted. And there were ads on the community. Now, at that time, they, they go public, by the way, in 2013, uh, in November 2013, at $41 a share. So that was the $41 to go public. Uh, now Musk is offering $54 a share, okay? But the, uh, the CEO of the company um, was a guy named Tom Costello. Um, I'm sorry, not Tom. It was Dick, Dick Costello, C-O-S-T-O-L-O. And in, uh, in the summer of 2015, um, the board decided that they were probably going to fire this guy. And I wrote a blog at the time saying that that was really, really a bad idea, that they shouldn't do it. That the stock price had dropped from 63 to 36. That was bad, and I understood it was bad. And they said the problem was that he had had revenue growth without sufficient profits. And I said, well, doesn't that describe Jeff Bezos? Revenue growth, but not yeah, well. But here were the numbers, and I pulled these up again. They're in the blog, and I'll put a link out on the, when we post this. But from 2011 to 2014, Dick Costolo grew the revenue at Twitter by over 100% every year. For three consecutive years, he more than doubled. It was far better than revenue growth at Facebook or Amazon. Um, his growth in active users was greater than Facebook or Amazon. But this, get this, his revenue growth per user was two times Facebook and eight times Amazon. Wow. Right, right. He was outperforming everyone. Now, remember our story. Know your value proposition so you know who you're talking to, you know what you need to say. And number two, focus on revenues. The most important thing to focus on is revenues. And Dr. Dick Costolo did that. Now, he didn't get the board and he didn't get in, he didn't drive that message through to investors. And that was a big mistake on his part. If he'd have driven that through to investors, his share price would have been higher because we see that happening today, right? Which I, I'm always saying follow the revenues, check the revenues. See where the revenues go. Well, anyway, they throw him out, and then one of the original founders was a guy named Jack Dorsey. And so, in October of '15, the board brings Jack Dorsey back in, and he comes in and he says, uh, you know, basically, he's going to revitalize. Uh, Twitter and I wrote in the blog then on October 5th of 15. I said, what do you mean revitalize? You already are outperforming on a revenue basis all of your competitors, outperforming Facebook and everyone else, right? So why why is it that you have a problem? Well, the biggest problem that was occurring was that uh, Twitter was a one trip pony. It had tweets. But what Facebook had done between 2013 and 2015 is they had added um, uh, Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp. 
to their portfolio. And thus, they had really grown substantially the size of the platform. And they had created far more opportunities to interact. And what each of those did, what, what, uh, in, in, what Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp did, was it extended the Facebook reach so that we could connect up with people. We could do it by text on Facebook. We could do it with these small videos on Instagram. We could do quick messages on Messenger. Uh, and then uh, we could connect up with people far away and do long chats, etc. On, on WhatsApp. So we were, he was giving us more ways, more value delivery systems. Instead of the one value delivery system, which was Facebook, he was adding additional value delivery systems to fulfill the value proposition of trying to connect the world. But what had happened to Twitter is we could see that they had grown their revenues, but they had not, they just had one value delivery system. And then they let that value delivery system grow a bit stale compared to the competition, and so they fired the, the CEO. And, and Dorsey came in, and at the time I said, this is not a good idea, the stock's 26 bucks, and Dorsey, has, he doesn't know what, he has no idea of a value proposition. And in fact, in this last discussion that has been going on publicly about you know whether or not Musk should buy um, Twitter, Dorsey came out and said that he was more than happy for somebody to take over because Dorsey doesn't have a value proposition. He can't tell you what the value proposition is for Twitter. And he, he said he didn't even know how to run it and he didn't know who could run it. He wasn't sure it should be a company as if it maybe should be some kind of a nonprofit or something, I guess. And he said he didn't know it, how it would be run. And I'm saying, wait a minute, you've been getting paid to be the CEO of this company for, for seven years? And from 2015 to 2022, or six and a half years, and you don't have a clue what your company's value proposition is. That's ridiculous. And that's why the share price was terrible. That's why it went nowhere. Was because the company, you know, it had come back up in 2021. It had finally gotten back up to some of those peak numbers around 60 bucks a share. But nobody had much faith in it. And the, the problem was they were focusing on active users, the number of active users they had. That's what Dorsey kept trying to do is get more active users. Well, what did he get? A lot of bots. A lot of spam bots, robots, a lot of bots out there running around, sticking messages out, uh, doing retweets. And he had focused, instead of focusing on real users or the real community getting connected, what he had done is he had created this massive algorithm to try to push people around. So instead of us finding each other organically, which is how the company had been founded back in 8 and 9, he was now trying to force it to happen, thinking he was you know, using the Facebook playbook. But in fact, he didn't know the Facebook playbook. And yeah. nobody knows what the algorithms are. And now, I have to admit, I think Twitter is a bit of a sewer. Okay. I, I, I have about 14,000 Twitter connections now. Remember, I had 10,000 in 2010. Why don't I have 100,000? Well, it's because I don't know who these people are. And I don't want to follow. I don't want to go out and follow um, a Kardashian. That's of no interest to me, right? And, and the way each Kardashian person probably has a million or more followers, right? Uh, there's a lot of people that are celebrities that are on this platform of Twitter, but but they're not. They're they're there because they're celebrity. That what do they stand for? You know, what is their value yeah. proposition? What are their interests? And and I don't know that. And and when I and one of the things I did about I think it was about 2015, I had a fellow that worked for me, an intern, and uh, we spent um, six weeks where he did nothing but cull down uh, my Twitter uh, network. At the time, I had 40,000 people. I had 40,000 connections in my network. Okay, this is uh, 2014. 2014. And, uh, and he and I looked at it and I said, I bet a lot of those aren't real. And it took, after six weeks of him every day, this is all he did was he sat there on Twitter and tried to find out, is this a real person or not a real person? We went from 40,000 people to about 16,000. The rest of them were all just dummy accounts, fakes, meaningless bots, things like that. And ever since then, I've had a lot of trouble getting any value out of the platform, right? And as you and I talk about growing the Spark Partners business, you know, we never talk about running ads. Yeah, it's, I'm really interested to see, Elon Musk is a, is a very smart guy. He surrounds himself with very smart people. He has a firm grasp on the, the value of both Tesla and you know Solar City, he's done some good things. Of course, he wants to put a man on the, on Mars, so to speak. And so, I'm just really interested what's going to happen in the next really 18 months, two years, four years. Well, I, I want to back up on that one, and, and because 
I have been a fan of these companies, right? And and I have been, long been a fan of Tesla. I promoted buying the stock in 2010. Um, I thought they made a good product. And and he was out to electrify things. So Solar City was a company he founded, and then somebody else ran, and then he it, it wasn't his, and then he bought all of it and brought it back into Tesla again. But Solar City was about making electricity. It was about solar panels. It was about solar shingles. And it was a value proposition of, of create your own electricity. Get off the grid to some extent, become less dependent on the grid, that's for sure. And and think about electrifying, get away from using gasoline and the natural gas and other forms of energy. And then he had this car company and the car company said, yeah, get around by using an electric car because it's a better car. I mean, I'll never forget that whenever it was evaluated in 2012 um, by Motor Trend, it was considered the best car out there because the report said it was the best car out there. Not the best electric car, the best car. It had good pickup, it had good performance, it had good handling, it had all these benefits. And they said, this is just a great car. And they said, one of the reasons it's a great car is because it is electric. That elect By being electric, it didn't have some of the failings of an engine transmission and braking system that you have in a traditional internal combustion engine car. So there was a value proposition here, right? And even when he opened the boring machine company, right, which goes out and bores tunnels to transport people, again, he had a clear value proposition. He said the highways are congested. It's difficult for people to get around. Let's start to build tunnels to relieve the congestion. And the tunnels will either we drive through the tunnel, but, you know, we'll figure the transport system out as we build the tunnels. And he started boring, and, and he's been able to generate revenue. If you look at all those, Solar City sold out its capacity every year. Tesla sells out all its cars every year. The boring machine company gets paid for for boring those holes, whether it's underneath the Las Vegas Strip or trying to bore a hole from Los Angeles to San Francisco, they're getting paid. The revenues are there. They're tracking the revenues because they have a value proposition and they know where they're headed. What I haven't heard Musk say is what is the value proposition of Twitter. But you think he dropped $50 he billion on, on, a, on a bet? I mean, he's got to have something in, the, in mind. Well, I don't know about, about that. I, I, I unfortunately think that people can, when they get to a powerful positions, their egos can start to eclipse their uh, their logic. Um, I mean, even, even let's just take like, you know, um, I'm trying to remember now, SpaceX, right? SpaceX. SpaceX is not only revenue generating, it's profitable. And how? Well, because he wanted to explore space, but he started, he, he didn't start by saying, I'm going to go to Mars. He started by saying, NASA's getting out of this explore space or, or commercializing of space. We need to put more satellites in space. I want to come up with a rocket company to, to, to do this. And he said, I'm going to make rockets that are more effective. So instead of just blasting the space and dropping in the ocean, we're going to land them again. So they'll go up and they'll land and we'll reuse them again and again and again and that'll be far cheaper. And so he, he, he has a value proposition which is, I'm going to help commercialize space. He gets revenue, which is people who want to have satellites put in space and he builds a value delivery system around that in terms of how I'm going to build rockets, how they're going to be reusable rockets and all those elements that go into the value delivery system that he has. So clear value proposition leads to a clear a clear value delivery system and generating revenue. And there's real clear revenue growth in all aspects of those businesses. And I want to keep going back. That's what Facebook did. It had a very clear value proposition about networking and get us to network. It started off with your friends from high school, friends from college, but now quickly, you know, we're beyond that. I don't keep track of those people that are not in my network, but the people in my network are people that are business people that are interested in innovation and innovation interested in strategy, interested in trends, and those are the people that I network with. On, on Now, my value delivery system of preference is Facebook. I enjoy that one. I think you enjoy Instagram. Yeah. I, I know that Sydney really enjoys Instagram, and she uses And, and TikTok, for that matter. Yeah. Well, and, so, and now, but the second value delivery system I use a lot is WhatsApp. You and I communicate on WhatsApp because it's great for long-form communications that we have. And I also have uh, uh, business associates around the world. And WhatsApp is fantastic for people I'm talking to in Asia, people I'm talking to in Europe. Uh, we can communicate at no cost, and we can use this long-form communication on WhatsApp. So the value proposition is clear, and the user and the, rev uh, the revenues are growing. And so and as we had, a, uh, we had a, one of our podcasts, we talked about how the revenue per user – at Facebook has been growing every year for 10 years and it, it went from like four dollars to forty dollars a 10x improvement in revenue per user over that over the last 10 year period so so the, the mission of this podcast that I have is to say that if you really know your value proposition 
and then you really hone your value delivery system and then expand that value delivery system so that you reach people in multiple ways to deliver your value, then you can grow. And the way we grow, track growth, should be revenue. So you can have early warning signs like, okay, how many users do you have? And those kinds of uh, statistics can be helpful in predicting perhaps what revenues might be, but they're not the end game because as we saw at Apple, the number of iPhones sold, the, the year over year growth in iPhone sales, the number of iPhones, it, it slowed. But what did they do? They dramatically increased the revenue per iPhone user. So the revenues continued to have you know 20% plus growth every year at Apple. So that's what we want to focus on. We want to focus on our value proposition, how we deliver it, and then measure it in revenues. And if your revenues are still moving forward, then that's a good sign. So today, we've been having these podcasts lately talking about my favorite companies, right? Meta got hammered. Stock price went down. It went all the way from almost 400 down to like 180. It recently had a bounce back. But what do I keep saying? The revenues are there. The revenues are there. The revenues are there. Don't get distracted. Same thing with Netflix. It's been hammered. It's lost two-thirds of its value this year. A lot of people running for the hills, and they're saying, well, the reason is that Right, they've signed up everybody that can sign up. You can't sign up any more people. I don't know if that's true. I know we talked about how they lost the, the Russian market and that did, did caused a decrease in the number of total customers they had. But what I do know is the revenues are still going up. The revenues per user are going up, right? And they're going yeah. up at a rate 10% or greater. So I continue to be a fan of companies that can do that. Um, and, uh, the Amazon's revenues are going up, its revenue per user is going up. Google revenues are going up, their revenue per user are going up. So I, if, if, if you've got the value proposition, which those companies do, they know what their, their customer want, they have multiple value delivery systems that are clearly targeted at segments and categories, of the of the value of the customer base so they have multiple value delivery systems and then on top of that you have revenue growth that's the winning trifecta when you've got that you're an unstoppable machine and then stock price becomes noise. I mean, there's a lot of reasons people are getting out of the stock market now, right? They say it might be overvalued. Uh, there's, nobody knows what's going to happen with the situation in Ukraine and people are hoarding dollars right now the dollar has reached a record high value i, I, I think maybe in, in like the last hundred years people are hoarding dollars because they're fearful of the war in, uh, in ukraine expanding into something much bigger people uh, are concerned about inflation the last time we had high levels of inflation financial assets dropped precipitously that was back in the 70s and early very early 80s when uh, you know hyperinflation existed for six seven years in a row and it just really killed financial assets so people there's all kinds of big mega reasons like that that people yeah, there is. jump out of the stock market but i i will let you know that you know personally i haven't sold anything and that's because the companies that i'm invested with are the ones we talk about and and they're great companies and they're continuing to grow and they're continuing to get more consumer dollars and as people are spending less on things they might be spending a little less on their iphone or a little less on netflix but they're really cutting their costs by trying to drive less and buy less gasoline yeah. right they're, they're switching from eating meat to eating pasta and things like that that's where the big switches are happening yeah. And these are all trends that we talk about on a, on a constant basis. And, you know, uh, I've always known about trends. I've always sort of had my ear to the, the ground, but I never really did it with such intent. Then after I met you, uh, you know, three years ago, and as we began this journey of the podcast and our courses and all the things that we do, it's really a matter of, it's that perception. It's that, that way of looking at the world that goes beyond which which just surrounds you in the static sort of time but looking at what's happening in the future you know we've talked about this many times that the future is uh, or looking in f at the future forecasting the future is not uh impossible it's not a fool's game or whatever yeah. that, that uh, phrase is but uh but certainly we have a whole platform in our course think innovation we also have some exciting news about the course that we'll uh, we'll share next time about some new directions we're taking with how we're going to be distributing the course and and certainly we're always excited to uh, uh, talk to users you're always welcome to email myself at manny at sparkpartners.com or adam at sparkpartners.com and we have some engaging conversation with uh, certain uh, clients that way uh, adam and i are also available for coaching and for workshops and other things so we're always uh, we love what we do we love getting the word out and uh, we're really looking forward to what happens with not only uh, 
uh, Twitter. I mean, I'm excited only because it's such a weird situation. You know, it's like uh, somebody just buying something out off a whim that's clearly not, in the, like you mentioned, the, your, the value isn't clear, and what he's going to be doing with it isn't necessarily clear. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Well, again, um, if you don't know your value proposition, you're not very likely to succeed. If you haven't aligned your value delivery system to fulfill the value, you're not going to succeed. If you don't keep updating, modifying, enhancing, and expanding your value delivery system into new techniques, new methods to reach the delivery of your value, you're not going to succeed. And if you're not growing your revenues at 10% or more per year, you're not sustainable and you won't succeed. So how are you, if you don't have the tools to accomplish that, then why aren't you buying this course? Because this course will give you the tools to do that. And it's not hard for me to sit here and say, if you don't have those three things, your value proposition, value delivery system, and revenue growth, you can't succeed. You can't be long-term sustainable. And this course will get you there. So uh, if you don't have that answer, then it's time to sign up. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, I invite you guys to go to our website at sparkpartners.com. Let us know, uh, you know, send us an email. And, uh, and with that, Adam, have a wonderful week, and we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you, Manny.